Okay. How are we doing this morning? Ready to go? Yes. Okay. Any questions for me before we begin? Okay, great. I'm hearing correct information being shared about finals and such. So good job. Okay. So we moved on to talk about the heart. Uh, so we're going to start by thinking about some of the function of the heart. All right. So the point of our heart is to pump blood throughout our body so that we can get things like oxygen to our cells, glucose, so we can take away waste products, take away carbon dioxide. Um, we'll talk a fair bit about how gas exchange happens with the blood. Okay. In terms of like mapping where the heart is in the system, we take everything starting from our heart. Once you leave the heart, that is by definition an artery. So arteries are defined as blood vessels that leave the heart. We then have a lot of branching in those blood vessels. So from our arteries, you branch and branch, just like a tree has branches, but getting smaller and smaller and smaller towards the tips. So our next smallest blood vessel so our next largest blood vessel, I guess I'll say, are the arterioles. So we're gonna talk when we talk about the vasculature itself um, about the purpose here, but basically our arterioles are going to vary something called resistance um, to kind of regulate where our blood goes, which of our organs it's easier to get blood to. Exchange itself between the blood and tissue, so between your blood, your interstitial fluid, and therefore your cells is happening at the capillaries. So like when we looked at capillary beds um, connecting the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary, exchange of hormones was able to happen there because it was a capillary bed. Capillary beds are for exchange. On the other side of the capillary, um, we are going to start returning to the heart. One of the main things we're exchanging in the capillaries uh, is this is part of where that oxygen exchange is happening. So in the capillaries, we offload a lot of oxygen at the tissue. So now we have to bring our deoxygenated blood, which has also been filled with carbon dioxide as a byproduct of metabolism happening in the tissue. We have to get back to the heart. So now we build up from smaller to large again. So venules are kind of small. And then veins are large to the point that you'd be able to see them with your naked eye in the body. And they come back to the heart with that deoxygenated blood. But we wanna be careful. Veins are defined as coming back to the heart. It's a generalization that they are deoxygenated because we have a slightly uh, flipped situation happening with the blood that comes out of our right ventricle and goes to the lungs to be oxygenated. Um, those are still gonna be described as arteries when they go to the lungs, veins when they come back, even though the reason they're going to the lungs is to get oxygenated. So our pulmonary arteries don't have oxygen yet, our pulmonary veins do. Our blood, our cardiovascular system is a closed loop. So you're exchanging like oxygen, carbon dioxide primarily, all your nutrients, but you're not like losing blood at your capillaries into tissue. Like all our blood has to just kind of keep circulating around. It's a circulatory system. Okay, so we got a closed loop, which means one of the things we're going to do uh, is track through where things go and why in that closed loop. Just a tidbit first about what is actually in the blood. So we'll talk more about blood composition when we talk about like how do blood clots form? Um, but just so you know, for now, you've got red blood cells in the blood. They're the ones that are transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide, our gases. You've got white blood cells called leukocytes. Um, so these are part of your immune system. They're defending your body against pathogens. We've got platelets. 
which are going to be like little self fragments. So think about like little kind of like pancakes or something. Uh, they're going to be important for blood clotting. So they're going to get sticky and help cover over holes that shouldn't be there. And then we have the fluid in the blood itself. So plasma makes up actually 55% of your whole blood volume. So plasma was one of our two types of extracellular fluid, right? So the fluid, the cells that it is extra, the cells so that it is outside are these erythrocytes, leukocytes, and maybe we can count platelets as cells. Um, they're really broken parts of cells, but we'll, we'll let them be. Okay, so plasma is basically the water and ions that are in the blood around these cells. So when we talk about blood, we will eventually be talking about like, okay, how do we regulate how much water there is in the plasma? How do we regulate what the concentration of those ions is? Um, because that's important for how your body functions. Okay. But let's think about the flow first, because that's really what the heart is most concerned with. Okay. So we're going to start out by thinking about two circuits. So we've got Overall, from the heart, there's one closed loop, but it's basically got like two tracks, right? So this is gonna be my heart. And I like to just draw a heart like this and then make it kind of a four part like this. This is not anatomically accurate, but this is gonna let us track through what's going where. So at the top of the heart, we have the atria, right and left. So I'm gonna write RA for right atrium. LA for left atrium. And then at the bottom, we have two ventricles. So I'm going to write RV for right ventricle and LV for left ventricle. So that's just my, my shorthand here. Okay. So when we have blood coming to the heart, our first job is going to be to get that blood oxygenated. Okay. So our first circuit is the pulmonary circuit. And its job is to get that blood to the lungs, okay? So I'm gonna draw some big lungs on either side, I guess, okay? So here's my trachea, like basically my windpipe, right? I have a lung over here, and I'm gonna put a lung over here, okay? Cool, all right. So our pulmonary circuit comes from the right side of the heart. So blood returns through the veins to your right atrium, goes through a valve to the right ventricle, and then goes into the pulmonary circuit to the lungs. Okay, so we have arteries leave the heart. So we have a pulmonary artery going from that right ventricle to the lungs. And then once we pick up oxygen in the lungs, get rid of our carbon dioxide, we wanna come back. So we're gonna have pulmonary veins now coming to the left side of the heart. An atrium, think like a building, right? Like the atrium is kind of like a, like a waiting area at the front of a building. Stuff comes into the atria and then leaves through the ventricles, okay? So this is our pulmonary circuit that I've just drawn here. So supplied by power from muscle contraction in the right side of the heart, comes out of the heart, comes back to the heart, but now to the left side. Our systemic circuit is what comes out of that left ventricle, okay? So our systemic circuit is going everywhere else in the body. So it's gonna supply all of your organs. Um, I'm gonna draw this, and we're gonna get a foot, I guess but all of our organs, right? So when we have blood going through the systemic circuit, we're coming from the left ventricle. So the left side of the heart, we come out a really big blood vessel, our biggest artery, the aorta. We go through all our many branches, um, get out to our organs, all our systemic tissues, okay? And then we return through our large veins to the heart, specifically to the right atrium. Okay, so we've got 
two circuits, right? So two loops, right? We're almost making, I don't know, kind of a figure eight, right? So we went from the right side to the left side. Then we came out the left side and came back to the right, to the right atrium. So it's the same blood going through all these places. Um, we have to do one through then the other, which is what we mean by series flow. Okay. So series flow through the cardiovascular system means we do like one, then the other parallel flow means we do two things at the same time. So we'll take a look at those in a second. Okay, so we have our flow through the systemic and pulmonary circuits in a series, right? So we have to go, right? Here's our heart, okay? So we have to go first to the lungs, right? That's loop one, right? And then we go out to the rest of the body. That's loop two. Right, so they're a series because we can number them one, two. We have to do them in sequence before we're finally back at our starting point, which would be the right atrium where we're collecting all our returning venous blood. Parallel flow is when you can't number stuff one, two, three, four, five, because it's going multiple places at once, okay? Now, this is going to happen specifically within the systemic circuit, really. It's where we think about it. What's happening here, it's like, let's, let's ignore the lungs for, for right now, right? But when you're leaving the heart, right? So our systemic circuit is coming from that left ventricle, right? And we're going everywhere to the rest of the body, right? You want blood flow going to your brain and the heart muscle and the liver and the kidney and the skin, et cetera, et cetera. You don't do it in an order, right? You don't go first, I'm gonna take the blood to the brain, whatever oxygen is left, I'll take it to the liver, whatever oxygen is left after that third, I'll go to the kidneys, fourth, I'll go to the skin, et cetera. That's not how it works, right? Instead, we have our branching system where at the same time, right, there is a branch going to the brain, a branch going to feed the heart muscle itself, a branch to the GI tract, a branch to the kidneys. And at any point in time, you've got blood flowing to all of those places at once. And they all have nice fresh blood. They're not getting progressively less and less oxygen because that blood has really only been at the heart, right? It's, it's freshly oxygenated blood. Okay, so this is why we refer to it as parallel flow. Because think about it, right? Like these are all happening in parallel, right? These lines are parallel to each other and it can't be uh, series flow because we can't number them one, two, three, four, five, right? It's all happening all at once. So that's what's going on specifically in that systemic circuit, this part, all right? So systemic circuit is parallel flow. And that's where we're going out to all of the organs and your tissue in parallel, okay? So the only like series part, right, is that first you go from an artery, then to an arterial, to a capillary, but like the flow to the organs is happening at the same time. Was trying to ignore on that previous image the like lungs and the heart itself for the reason of like those can be confusing for people because like the heart is filled with blood right your heart needs oxygen because it needs to feed the heart muscle the heart is made of cardiac muscle tissue um but exchange doesn't happen with the blood that's inside those chambers of the heart. It needs to be fed from its own like capillaries, right? So your heart muscle itself 
actually gets blood from arteries lying on the surface of the heart. So it's this surface vasculature that gives the heart oxygen, takes away carbon dioxide, gives it glucose, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a separate way of, of feeding that heart muscle on the outside. So we would consider the coronary circulation, which is the name for this, this blood system on the surface of the heart. It's part of the systemic circuit, right? So like, right, that's why it's here, right? So part of the systemic circulation. Okay. Now keeping your heart functioning is really important. So what we're looking at here, this big arch, this is the aorta. So this is coming from the left side of the heart, from the left ventricle, really big and strong, sending out blood to your whole body. The first thing to branch off of your arterial system, off of that aorta, is happening right at the base of the aorta. So the absolute first thing, the first branch coming off of that arterial system is feeding the heart muscle itself so it can keep doing its job. Then there are capillaries and veins returning that blood to the right atrium as well. So the right atrium would be somewhere over here. Yeah. So your heart is in your thoracic cavity, so held within your rib cage. Um, in terms of what's surrounding it, uh, you have your lungs on either side. So those are here in purple, okay? You have your diaphragm below. So the diaphragm is a muscle that helps you expand and compress your lungs. Okay, so that's to do with breathing. And that's what separates your heart and lungs from the abdominal cavity, which is where you would have like your stomach, your intestines, stuff like that. Your heart's about the size of your fist, which is often smaller than, than people think. Uh, weighs approximately 300 grams thereabouts. And then we have layers surrounding the heart. So we have a protective sac that's basically made of a membrane. Um, it's called the pericardium. So peri means like next to, so next to the cardium, next to the heart. So that's what this like yellow orange line is supposed to be here. Okay. And this lubricates the heart. So like as your heart pumps, right, it's got a wiggle. So it's got a wiggle against the lungs, right? You want that to be slippery. You don't want that to be rough and frictiony because that would kind of burn, right? So we've got this lubricated sac around the outside. That's the pericardium. And then inside we have layers to the heart wall, okay? So there's kind of external kind of skin to the heart, let's almost say the epicardium, okay? The bulk of the heart is made up of the myocardium. So this is the cardiac muscle, right? Myo for muscle, myocardium, the muscular part. Cardiac muscle cells involuntarily controlled are here, okay? So these are some of our effector organs for the autonomic branches of the nervous system. Then we have another cell layer on the inside lining those cavities uh, that are gonna fill with blood. Okay, now a ton of what we're gonna think about when we're talking about the heart has to do with pressure, okay? So it's gonna be really important to realize like high pressure drives flow, right? So think about just like squeezing a balloon or something, right? Like you squeeze it, if you leave a little hole, you hear that sound, air comes out, this is because air or any fluid is gonna go from an area of high pressure where you're squeezing, right? To areas of low pressure, like out in the environment. So this is actually just like our chemical gradients, right? We're going high to low. So high pressure to low pressure, just like we went from high concentration to low concentration. Same thing is happening with pressure gradients. Okay. So the way your heart beats and gets blood to the body is it changes the pressure inside the chambers of the heart 
which moves the blood. Okay. However, we have a closed loop system, right? And we need the blood to go everywhere in a specific order. So you're going to have different parts of the heart contracting and relaxing. We're also going to have control mechanisms to make sure you don't have like basically backwash, right? So after we contract, if you then relax, you're kind of creating a low pressure environment. So we're going to have some valves that prevent the blood from then just turning around and rushing backwards, like a wave crashing on the beach or something. Okay. So that is going to be part of what is happening with our two types of valves. So we're going to find valves between the atria and the ventricles. So we'll have one between the right atrium and the right ventricle, and one between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And we're also going to have a different type of valve in the arteries that are leaving the heart. So your pulmonary trunk leads to your pulmonary arteries from the right side. So we'll have a valve there to prevent backwash from the lungs as we're trying to like oxygenate that blood. And we'll have a valve at the base of the aorta to prevent the blood that we've just pumped into the aorta, into the systemic circuit from immediately returning it to the heart and just kind of getting sucked back. Okay. So this is going to help us have the blood always, always, always go in the same direction. Okay. Uh, when this says normal direction of flow, right? This is just telling you you always go from an atrium to a ventricle, from a ventricle to an artery. Right? That's that's our normal direction of flow. All right. So we're going to start with those valves between the ventricles. Okay. So on the right side, we have a valve that has three cusps. So a cusp is just like, you know, like a point on a crown, essentially. Those are cusps. So on the right side, between the right atrium and the right ventricle, we have our tricuspid valve. Okay. And on the left side of the heart, sorry, the reason it's hard to draw three is because one would be facing like where you are sitting, right? Because this is in 3D space. But that's what's happening between right atrium and right ventricle. And on the left side, we have another uh, atrioventricular valve. It only has two cusps, okay? Uh, so it is called the bicuspid valve, or sometimes the mitral valve, named after the hat a bishop wears. Okay. So what's happening here with these valves is that when the right atrium contracts, all right, so we create high pressure in the right atrium. Blood will go in to the right ventricle. But then that ventricle is going to contract, creating high pressure in that right ventricle. And what we don't want to happen is for that blood that we've just put into the right ventricle to just like loop back because our pressure gradient has reversed. What we want to happen is we want that blood to come out of the right ventricle and instead go from high pressure in the right ventricle out to the lungs. So what our valve does is our valve is gonna shut. And when it's shut closed, that means we can't go back, right? We just bounce off that closed valve. So this is why we also have some musculature associated with the um, cusps of the valves. So we're going to have papillary muscles here. Okay. There's a lot of pressure in the heart. Uh, so what these stop is if you can imagine really, really high pressure in that right ventricle, right? You might it closed here and then these might get pushed back into the right atrium. Right, so like what would happen if our valves just swung the other direction and opened up that way? When something like goes in the wrong direction and kind of falls in the wrong di direction, that's called prolapse. So the fact that we have these cusps of the valves tethered here in the right ventricle, 
prevents this prolapse, prevents this kind of like inside out umbrella situation from happening. Okay. So there are things associated with that. Papillary muscles, those are the little peaks. And we have little strings called chordae tendinae that are attaching them to the cusps of the valve. The structure of the bicuspid valve on the left side of the heart is pretty much the same. It's just there's two cusps, but the same situation is happening, the same kind of function. But our semilunar valves, which are located in the pulmonary trunk and in the aorta, so basically in our arteries, are gonna work a bit differently. So we're not gonna have cords and muscles associated with them. What we're gonna do is have valves that are of a different shape. Okay, so we got our tube, okay? We're gonna put like our heart over here, okay? So what we want in our arteries, so in the aorta and in the pulmonary trunk, we want blood to go into the artery we don't want it to come back. Arteries are defined as blood away from the heart. So we don't want looping back to the heart when our pressure changes. Okay. So what we do is we have valves, our semi-lunar valves, named because they're kind of half moon shaped. You can see that shape there. Okay. They're like cups in the walls of the artery. I like that. All right. Okay. All right. So these ones, if you push from the heart side, these doors just swing open and flatten against the internal wall, okay? But if you try to have your blood flow the opposite way, right? Imagine we tried to go, whoop, back. Okay, so in flattened position, right? Those cusps would just collapse like that, right? So blood can flow through. But if blood goes the other way, it basically acts like sails, right? So it'll catch in these cups or in these cups and this balloons them open and the blood gets blocked, okay? So the fact that it's trying to block backflow actually prevents the blood from actually getting to the heart. So it's gonna open that little cup and then it's gonna have no choice but to just bounce back in the direction it should be going. Okay. So that's how a semi-lunar valve in general works. We have them in two places, the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So we've got an aortic semi-lunar valve, and then we have a pulmonary semi-lunar valve as well. Okay. So now we're gonna talk about how contractions get triggered, okay? So your heart is gonna work kind of like your nerves did and your muscles did, right? We're gonna be thinking about electrical activity, which for us basically kind of means action potentials, right? Okay. So your heart has a conduction system. So the conduction system is referring to this fact that we have electrical signaling in the heart that's gonna control the contractions and therefore the direction of flow of the blood. Okay. Now the heart is special because it has the ability to generate rhythm on its own. So like your heart doesn't have to wait for a nerve to tell it to be. The cells of the heart, some of them, in and of themselves just kind of pulse. Like some of your heart cells, if you put them in a Petri dish, would just keep pulsing, right? They have these sort of natural like waves of electricity building and then subsiding within them. So when we say that cardiac muscle is an effector organ for the autonomic nervous system, we don't mean that our sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves like are absolutely required to have any electrical activity in the heart. They're gonna be like modulating and adjusting this autorhythmic quality of the heart. So these cells that are part of the conduction system, these autorhythmic cells, are gonna provide a pathway for spreading excitation through the heart. And so by excitation, right, we basically mean like we're seeing changes to membrane potential because we have changes to what ions are there and 
in what amounts, which means that eventually we can affect heart muscle by creating depolarizations and action potentials, essentially. Just a kind of adjustment to that idea. Okay. So there are gonna be two types of autorhythmic cells. We're gonna have pacemaker cells, which actually like really create a discernible pace, the pulse kind of. And we're gonna have fibers that are more just for conducting that pace. So conducting that excitation. Okay. Right. So the pacemaker cells spontaneously depolarize Right? That's what makes them autorhythmic, right? They just do it kind of on their own. Um, so they depolarize the membrane potential, making that membrane potential more positive, generating an action potential. The cells just do that, okay? And they coordinate with each other and provide a rhythm to the heartbeat. The conduction fibers are going to be responsible for like spreading those action potentials from the pacemaker cells to the myocardium, which is the actual contractile muscle part of the heart. So you can think of the conduction fibers as like, they are not nerves, but like you can almost think of them as like the nerves of the conduction system. Okay, cool. All right, so we've got two types of pacemaker cells and three types of conduction fibers. So for our pacemaker cells, we're going to have the sinoatrial node. Okay. So I want you to notice atrial is in here. So we'll see that the sinoatrial or SA node is in the right atrium, right? That's what it's named for, sinoatrial node. This is going to be the one that under normal conditions really controls the sum total activity of the heart because it's the fastest, right? So the sinoatrial node is the main pacemaker of the heart, but we do have another type of pacemaker cell that kind of assists, could potentially take over if something goes wrong, uh, although it wouldn't do as good a job. Um, that's coming from another node. This is the AV node, atrio ventricular node. So this is going down, it's like almost between the atria and the ventricles. Okay, so it's a little further down in the heart. Then we have conduction fibers, which connect these and then connect these to the heart muscle. So we're gonna have the internodal pathways, the bundle of Hiss and the Purkinje fibers. And we'll look at them in a second. Before we do, just this explains why we think of the SA node as our main pacemaker for the heart, right? So the SA node fires 70 to 80 action potentials per minute versus the AV node fires 40 to 60 action potentials per minute bundle of Hiss and Purkinje fibers, two of those conduction fibers do still have a pulse, but it's even slower on the order of 20 to 40 action potentials for a minute. And basically what happens, right? Like, is if your SA node is firing, right? Versus your AV node is firing. If you're thinking from the perspective of a cardiac muscle cell, right? So like a heart muscle, cell, right? It's gonna notice, it's gonna create its own action potential every time it gets a signal, which means that it'll end up following that SA node fire, okay? So the SA node kind of overrides this slower pace from the AV node. Okay. So cardiac cells, so the muscle cells, cardiac muscle, is, are linked by gap junctions. So gap junction is just a gap in the cell membrane, which means that if we have one cardiac muscle cell oops, and another cardiac muscle cell, right, there's essentially like a tube between them. So you can have anything go directly from the cytoplasm of one to the cytoplasm of the other. 
which means that when we have a depolarization in one cell, right? So get a lot of positive ions in here, I'm being careful because now calcium is actually gonna be more important than sodium like versus our nerves, right? But these positive ions can just move and diffuse into our next cardiac muscle cell. So that's because of those gap junctions. That's our gap junction. So whatever is going fastest is going to set the rate for all of our heart. So when we're talking about the order that the conduction system is creating, we're spreading excitation between the cells. So we're like spreading these depolarizations and eventually creating action potentials. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to create a system where first our atria contract, right? So first the top part of the heart and then our ventricles contract. So like then the bottom part of the heart. Okay. So we're gonna go one, two, kind of down the heart. And this is gonna have the effect of letting blood fill in the atria and then the ventricles can pump out to the lungs or to the body, depending which ventricle we're in. Now, these are coordinated because all our cells are linked together by gap junctions and conduction pathways um, so that we can spread these electrical signals in a kind of systematic way. There's also kind of structural support to the cellular connections. Um, I'm not going to ask you about the specifics of the types of junctions because at least in this class, we haven't talked about all the many different types of cell junctions, um, but you probably will hear this word again at some point in your life. Cardiac muscle has something called intercalated discs, They're kind of like strong points of attachment, think about them that way, um, between the muscle cells of the heart. Uh, and they're composed of those gap junctions for the electrical part, as well as desmosomes resisting mechanical stress. So basically like their cytoskeletons inside the different cells are linked with this other type of joining point. Now, so that's what an intercalated disc is. Okay. And here we can see just like a schematic, All right? There. And here's another intercalated disc showing that gap junction and showing that more like structural support as well. So when we are conducting this impulse, our AP is action potential. So the action potential, the fastest one is in the SA node, the sinoatrial node. So we're starting in our right side of the heart in the atrium. So we're like, here. Okay. So SA node is up here. So part one, sinoatrial node in the right atrium. Go that right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. Okay, so we start with the SA node in the right atrium of the heart. Next. Signal's gonna get spread through the atrial muscles through some interatrial pathways. So interatrial means between the atria. So it's affecting both the right atrium and the left atrium, even though the node itself is on the right side. For our order, what's most important is that we next go to the AV node. AV node is going to be like here, maybe SA, okay? So we are going to travel from that SA node through an internodal pathway. So between the nodes, we'd have that internodal pathway, okay? Getting to that second pacemaker type of cell in that AV node. 
And there's a little bit of a delay here because of this spread. Then we're gonna go through the bundle of His or the atrioventricular bundle. So we're gonna go down towards the ventricles. So from the atria to the ventricles. So that's like step three. Uh, and I'm going to point out this line that I've been drawing between the ventricles. This is something called the interventricular septum. Interventricular, so between the ventricles. So it's labeled on your heart images as well, but ventricular. Okay. So the blood is separate in each ventricle. And a septum is a wall, just like the septum in your nose. Interventricular septum. Okay. So we're going through the bundle of His. Okay. And then we're going to split our branches. One heading us towards the right, one heading us towards the left. So those are your right and left bundle branches. So this is step four where we have these splitting. Okay. And then when we squeeze the ventricles, you wanna squeeze them like a tube of toothpaste, basically, right? You want all the blood, well, you want most of the blood to go out into the arteries. We'll talk about exactly how much of the blood actually gets there, but you wanna squeeze from the bottom up. So the Purkinje fibers, step five, are on either side, starting from the bottom and going up so that you can squeeze those ventricles starting at the bottom and then up and out to your arteries. Okay, so here we see that kind of drawn on. Oops, okay. So first we see that sinoatrial node, that SA node full of pacemaker cells up here in the right atrium, okay? So from the right atrium, we have some branches, some interatrial pathways that make sure that the left atrium gets some too. But in terms of our order, we're interested in that internodal pathway going from the SA node to the AV node, okay? So that second part, the AV node, located here kind of at the bottom, of the right atrium right before we go into the ventricles. We have at first just one little piece coming out of that AV node called our bundle of His. So like a bundle of fibers together, bundle of His. It branches into right and left inside that interventricular septum. So now you can see one going to the right, one going to the left. And then we have those Purkinje fibers looping up and around. Right, so Purkinje fibers up and around, those are what you see with those little branches into the myocardium and those papillary muscles. So those are all the parts of the heart that are controlling things. So now we're gonna think about like, what's going on on a bit more of, of the cellular level. Okay. So the heartbeat is controlled by those pacemakers, primarily in the SA node, although we also have pacemaker cells in the AV node. Um, these autorhythmic cells have what we call pacemaker potentials. So like if someone needs a pacemaker, right? it's taking over from one of these. You're getting a pacemaker to like jolt the heart and mimic this activity that happens naturally. So pacemaker potentials, there's spontaneous depolarizations. Okay? So we're gonna see depolarization means our membrane potential is going up, right? Uh, when we talked about our nerves, we talked about getting closer to a threshold. Um, so we're going up. What's happening here? is that we are closing potassium channels, okay? So, all right, so potassium channels are closing. So potassium usually wants to leave cells, okay? But we're shutting it down, okay? 
So now that potassium is trapped inside of our cell, okay? And then we're gonna open some other types of channels. So what we're gonna open, so we're gonna have a channel that allows both sodium and potassium to flow, okay? And we're gonna open a calcium channel. So potassium wants to flow out. So that is happening here in this sodium potassium channel, but we know we have a really, really strong gradient, a really strong electrochemical driving force on sodium. So on net, what we have happening is lots and lots of sodium flowing in, which is why this creates a net depolarization, okay? Calcium wants to flow into cells. There's nothing else happening through this calcium channel. So this is also causing depolarization, okay? Now we are going to have um, kind of an order to things here, okay? So we are going to see that we are going to depolarize to a threshold and open faster calcium channels, creating an action potential. And then we're gonna repolarize by opening back up those potassium channels that we closed to begin with, allowing more potassium to leave the cell, rush out of the cell, bringing us back down to our resting membrane potential for these heart cells. So this is like analogous to the stages of the action potential that we saw in our neurons, okay? But we now have different channels to think about. Okay, so we're thinking a lot more about calcium than we were before. Right? So calcium was important for muscle contractions. Calcium is also super important for heart function. So that's where we will leave it for today. And we'll pick back up. Okay.